Y'all ready for this? It's my last full one. Might do some like tweaks and pop-ups, but. All right, so defamation. It's this is the end. Defamation. The elements of defamation are a defamatory false statement of fact of or conserving, concerning the plaintiff, publication, basis of liability, which is an actionable level of intent, and damages. So we're going to go through them. Does anyone else feel like this last week? I'm like, now I know how to do this. And before then, it's like, what was I doing? What did I write? Why doesn't this make sense? Life. Okay, so defamation. Element one, defamatory. So a, the trier of fact gets to judge defamatory unless it is so clear that it can be decided by law. And we all know that life from our constructive eviction case. Uh, so there is no there is no right thinking person rule here. What we're looking at at is um, some an Im important and respectable part of the community approach. So this is much harder to discern and more flexible means not losing face among thieves. That is mumbo jumbo. Maybe I don't know how to do this as well as I thought. Actually, these this was the class that we, I don't know. Anyway, um, so for, we're still on def, defamatory. So it can be an inducement. If language about the plaintiff is not defamatory on its face, the plaintiff must plead extrinsic facts because of which the words were reasonably understood to convey the meaning defame the plaintiff. And then there's also innuendo. So when a statement is not defamatory on its face, in addition to pleading the inducement facts, the plaintiff must also plead that in light of these facts, the implication of statements is defamatory. So then we have a false statement of fact. The court is looking for something material The court is looking for something materially and factually incorrect. Saying the defendant whipped, so our, the case we had, the defendant whipped five people when it was only three, that's not going to be understood as materially false. Uh, so the rule is plaintiff must prove the falsity, not defendant proving truth. So the one who's saying he lied about me, they have to prove that it was a lie. And then there's the Philadelphia News Rule, the burden of proof regarding falsity. At least where there is a media defendant and the matter is one of public concern, even a private plaintiff must prove falsity. So, at least where there is a media defendant and the matter is one of public concern, even a private plaintiff must prove falsity. So this kind of like is the opposite of, no, the plaintiff must prove falsity. That's our rule. The plaintiff must prove falsity. Let's all remember that. The common law is the defendant must use as affirmative defense and the presumption that the statement was false as the plaintiff alleged. So we're, we've kind of, the Philadelphia rule. Flips it on its head. Common law said, we're going to take it as false. Philadelphia rule says, plaintiff must prove false. Modernly, the Supreme Court, when there is a media defendant, the plaintiff must prove falsity. I'm going to have to relook at that because I have the same thing written down. Okay, falsity of burden of proof for public official and public figures. Under the New York Times v. Sullivan and its progeny, public and its progeny, public officials and public figures must prove actual malice. 
knowing falsity or reckless disregard of the truth by clear and convincing evidence. So actual malice is knowing falsity or reckless disregard of the truth by clear and convincing evidence. And then we have the question, can you be liable for defamation for an opinion? Under Milkovich, there is no constitutional protection for opinion. In other words, opinion may be deemed actual defamation. However, the court defines opinion in a manner that include that includes it as an assertion of fact. So for example, in my opinion, Irwin is a liar. Oh, okay. So if you're saying, in my opinion, so-and-so is a liar, that liar term is based on facts. So they're saying that that would be defamation. But if you say Irwin is a fool, it's less precise. So fool is probably not going to win a defamation case. Um, no defamation if language is loose, figurative, or hyperbolic. I would say me calling th people dirty dogs, probably too loose. Also, it's usually O or A. So also, analyze whether general tenor of the speech negates the impression that the speaker was seriously making false factual assertions. So look at the tenor. Let's look at the whole picture. And then third element, of and concerning the plaintiff. So how much does the statement point to the person? One L. Torts professor who plays music during every class. Yeah, we know who that is. New Mexico sales, no, Neiman, Neiman Marcus saleswomen. Some Neiman Marcus saleswomen, but there's 350 of them, so too large of a group to be personal. Neiman Marcus sales guys, 15 out of, Neiman Marcus sales guys are homosexual. Okay, well, 15 of them sued because there was only 25 of them, and the court said that is specific enough. So you got to look at the size of the group. Fourth element, publication. This is merely a communication of defamatory nature to someone other than the person defamed. So, um, self-publication is when you talk to a spouse, but that does not... That does not count as defamation. But if you have to tell an employer like why you were um, fired, that could be self-publication. I don't know why that matters, though. Sorry. All right, single publication rule. Each edition of a newspaper, magazine, or book is held to be a separate publication. Same with each broadcast or rebroadcast over radio and TV, each exhibit of a movie. But if 100 newspapers each publish in their own editions a new report provided by an external source, this is 100 publications. Generally, on a website, each edit is not a new publication. So publishers are liable for defamation just as the original publishers are. The 1996 CDA, no provider or user of an no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider okay so they that this act touches many different claims but for defamation we're saying they aren't the speaker nor are they a publisher. They're just a platform provider. Basic, okay. Um, the fifth prima facie element. Basis of liability. This mean this is basically our intent, intent element, and they're saying is the intent actionable. So broad. So we look at it broadly. Where does your mind have to be to find liability? Intent, we know, is the desire or substantial certainty, and in this case, it's to lower a reputation. And traditionally, there was strict liability. It is harsh on the defendant. If it were reasonable or in good faith but not true, it was still, you still said it, and you were liable. But then there was, then they moved, 
well, there was also a negligent standard for some. And this was the unreasonable belief that it was true. But it, you just, you know, out of negligence. But you still, there, that it was an unreasonable belief that something was true that was false. Um, but if it, there was a reasonable belief that it was true, then there was no negligence there. It is easy, the easier it is to win defamation, the more speech is chilled, hindered. Because, you know, it's kind of like a censorship. The more restrictive defamation is, oh, okay, the more restrictive we allow defamation suits to be, so we don't allow defamation suits as easily, the more free speech flourishes. And we have different kinds of people, and we're going to talk through them, excuse me, y'all. Okay. I wipe my nose. Sorry. We have public officials. These are elected or appointed people who act with the authority of the state. Look at their importance. All public employees are not public officials. Janitors at City Hall, not, not public officials. Here the standard is actual malice. So no strict liability or negligence. Actual malice is the term of art. It is not hatred. Um, when actual malice test is applied, the plaintiff may only prevail in defamation if the plaintiff proves that the defendant acted with knowing falsity or with reckless disregard for the truth. Reckless disregard is only when the defendant had serious doubts as to the truth of the publication. Actual malice can be, intended, can be the intent to avoid the truth. Um, and this is the Hardy Hanks rule. The Supreme Court held that actual malice is a question of law. And lawyers can ask questions on state of mind of publisher to discern actual malice. The more defamation advances in this realm, the more speech chills and people will self-censor. Public officials knowingly and willfully subject themselves to this criticism, though. So that's why they have a harder... Um, standard of actual malice and people have special concern over what public officials do then we have general purpose public public figures and they also must meet an actual malice standard and these are like our big stars um, the Kardashians George Clooney limited purpose public officials these limited public officials will only be given the actual malice standard as it relates to the field they're famous in so we talked about David Hogg um, from the Florida shooting, Broward County. Why can't I think of the name of the school? Anyway, so if he's talking in his, um, if someone's talking about him in his, uh, the role of like being an advocate and they say something that could be construed as defamatory. They have to prove actual malice for that. But if they're talking about something in his private life, then that will be given the standard of an ordinary person. Then we have regular people and we don't have to prove actual malice. Well, I mean, I am a YouTube star now as I see no one is watching my live stream. That's not the point. Anyway, even as a circus performer, as an actual person. Actual malice and presumed and punitive damages. Under common law, plaintiff did not have to prove damages and was awarded presumed damages. The Supreme Court ruled presumed damages were unconstitutional if dealing with negligent standard defamation, but may still be used for actual malice. Punitive damages are unconstitutional with a negligent standard, but not with actual malice, which makes sense because in actual malice, you're like actually wanting harm. So here's the analysis. Hardy Hanks wants us to look at who the person is, but the Broad Street um, case, they want us to look at the type of speech that it is. So we are gonna kind of do both. So public concern speech raises raises constitutional issues and therefore it needs to get more protection. 
private concern speech is not a constitutional issue, so the state gets to decide what level they're going to ask for, whether it's actual malice, negligence, or strict liability, and it then gets less protection. Um, I have chart, don't worry. View this as asking for analysis. So when you when you, we see this on the exam, we're going to go, okay, who is a person? Are they a public official, a general public figure, a limited public figure, or a private citizen? And then you're going to say, what kind of speech was involved, public pri or private? And then you're going to follow this test. And I think it's probably backwards for you again. So if you want this chart, I will send it to you, but you got to let me know somehow. So put in the comments or DM me or text me or see me at school. Okay, so we're looking at the person and the speech. So I'm going to go for just the actual malice requirement for liability. If it's a public official or a general purpose figure and it's any public or private speech, then yes, actual malice. If it's a limited public figure and it's a public concern, uh, like David Hogg murdering someone, actual malice is going to be shown. And this is a hypothesis. Thank you. Wait, that's not... Yes, because he's a limited public figure but it, and a murder would be a public concern. So yes, actual malice for that limited public figure. But if it's a limited public figure and it's a private concern, David Hogg getting into college, maybe the state is going to decide if it is a actual malice, negligence, or strict liability. If it's a private person and a public concern, so a person accused of murder, again, the state can choose between actual malice or negligence, but with a private person and a public concern, they're not going to use strict liability. And then we have a private person and a private concern. An average citizen committed adultery. And then again, we're going to say maybe. A state gets to decide whether it's actual malice, negligence, or strict liability. Okay, back to the top. Now we're going to talk about strict liability. Strict liability requirement for liability. So public, fig public and general figures talk about anything. Nope, they're always actual malice. Limited public figure and public concern. Nope, that's going to be actual malice. Too. My public figure and private concern, maybe strict liability. Um, the state gets to decide. Again, it could be actual malice, could be negligence. Uh, private person, public concern, no, you're not going to, we're not going to put strict liability on them. Maybe actual malice, maybe ne negligence, but not strict liability. And then a private person and a private concern, maybe the state gets to decide. I'm going to talk to a couple about that. All right, now we have the presumed and punitive damages without actual malice because with actual malice, presumed and punitive are allowed in all of these areas. So presumed and punitive without actual malice, not going to be allowed in public official or general purpose because you have to have malice. Same with limited fake public figure and public concern. No, they always need actual malice. Limited public figure and private concern, Yes, the court gets to decide if they want to put on presumed or punitive damages um, in any of the, whatever they decide. And then private person public concern, that is a constitutional issue. And the Supreme Court said says that when it's a constitutional issue, it must be actual malice to be awarded punitive or presumed or presumption damages. And then with the private person private concern, <clears throat> same, the the state court gets to decide the pres presumptive and punitive damages and whether they want to do that, um, whatever, if they do actual malice negligence or strict liability. Okay, now we have damages. And damages is where we go into libel and slander, which is usually the only thing anyone knows about defamation. So damages, libel and slander are not individual causes of actions, but they are two prongs to determine two prongs to determine 
and analyze damages, which make up the sixth element of defamation. So we have slander, and slander is easily said is spoken, but sometimes if it's like spoken on television, it could be considered libel, so that's not a rock solid assessment. Generally, the plaintiff must prove extra out of pocket lost income is a prerequisite for recovering general damages, plain and suffering. So slander is harder because you need, it's a pre, it requires the prerequisite, and it, and it's the prerequisite is externally externally imposed special damages. So that means if you get sick due to someone's defamation because you're so upset, it doesn't qualify to meet special damages prerequisite, even if it results in a loss of income. But um, if externally imposed special damages are established, plaintiff can recover both special and general. So the hyper, hypo for this is the Fuller case. Man. I'm struggling. A man accused of adultery that left him sick in bed. No externally imposed special, circum special damages. So if he had gone to work and been fired for his alleged adultery, the... Um, to his reputation if they said like we can't have someone like you here then yes that would have been externally imposed damage but um if he went to work and he was fired because he was depressed and they're like we can't handle you then that would still not be externally imposed then we have slander per se and that's libel standard for specials and generals and under slander per se there is no prerequisite of establishing externally imposed special damages per se is violating based on the claim of crime of moral turpitude which is like murder loathsome disease like so and so has leprosy conduct incompatible with profession so like a um pediatrician molested a child and serious sexual misconduct which could be the same i think the the main thing there is serious though because in our hypo, it was just adultery, but that wasn't enough to meet slander per se. Okay. So, crime of moral turpitude, some disease, conduct incompatible with profession, serious sexual, sexual misconduct. <clears throat> okay. The libel is print. I don't think of this as a publication. And so there's no prerequisite for externally and special damages uh, that are necessary to then recover general damages. Both can be recovered with or without the other. This makes it easier to recover in libel and that, to recover for libel than slander. But again, like libel is printed, but it also could be the radio or television or there, it's, and some people may say, well, that is, that is printed on film or printed on the internet or you know whether it's a video so maybe that's where the spoken and the printing can come together okay ambiguity when spoken words broadcast typically then still seen as libel three factors determining libel or slander the permanency of the publication internet how broadly decimated the publication is and whether the defamatory publication has a deliberate and premeditated character were they trying to be a jerk and now we have privileges, and privileges are um, affirmative defenses. And so there are absolute privileges, and these are, like, stronger. And the absolute priv privileges are judicial proceedings. All judicial proceedings are absolutely privileged. Thus, anything that's said in the course of a trial by the judge, the lawyers, or the parties that is related to the case cannot be the subject of a defamation lawsuit if it is false. It, but it must be relevant to the litigation to be protected. And then you have legislative proceedings. All federal and state legislatures are absolutely privileged while in session. Even statements that are unrelated to the proceedings are privileged. Um, okay. Executive communications. Senior policymakers are absolutely protected when speaking in their official capacity. Relevancy to their official capacity is required. And then we have conditional privileges, and these are qualified and weaker. Most conditional privileges protect speech that is made in good faith. So here we have common interest privileges. A conditional privilege applies 
where there's a relationship between the publisher and the statement and the person receiving the publication and they share a common special interest in the special matter. So the hypo is Dean Karen and Dean Helfen talking about Professor Cup in an evaluation in good faith, even if what they said turns out to be wrong or negligent. Religious communities, not our hypo, religious communities speaking about morality issues that someone knowingly and willingly became a part of the religious community, that is. And then we have reports of public proceedings as a matter of general interest. So many courts have made private, many courts made a privilege for accurate reports of judicial, legislative, and executive proceedings. Some courts have extended this privilege to accurate reports of all manner of public interest, but this is not, not different from the most qualified privileges because it applies when it applies even where the media source knows the person it is quoting is lying. And folks, those are my outlines. If I have time, and if I want to teach myself something, I will make update videos. Just remember, I don't purport that any of this is true. These are my working outlines. I know for a fact some of it is not right after I've said it or watched it or heard it or researched it. And I make no um, promise to fix because you don't have time. I don't have time. But I hope you learn the information. I hope you do amazing. 1L out!